Welcome to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr on Iowa Catholic Radio. Every Wednesday, diving deep in the truth of the Catholic Church and restoring all things in Christ. The Uncommon Good, live from the Mercy Live Up Studio. The Uncommon Good is on the air. I'm Bo Bonner. And Bud should be talking, but I didn't hear him. No, I'm Dr. Bud Marr. There you, you go. Me, yeah, yeah, this is the Uncommon Good. Uh, we're coming to you live. Some of us, li- well, both of us live. One of us from Mercy Live Up Studio. Actually, because of the technology of Mercy Live Up Studio, both Bud and I are coming to you. I am in Des Moines, and but we are both on 1150 AM, 88.5 FM, 94.5 FM, streaming live, iowacatholicradio.com, and on the Iowa Catholic Radio app. Brought to you by Blessman Ministries and the People's Abstract Company. Bud, how are you doing? I'm okay. It's unseasonably warm in, in Pittsburgh. I don't know what it's like there in Des Moines, but here the squirrels and the deer are just weirded out. They're kind of running in circles because it's September, but it feels like August. They're fighting each other. Does that happen in Pittsburgh? They're just sun tanning on the front, <laughs> front lawn. <laughs> they've, got, they've got their beach towels out. Are you sure that's deer and not and French fries? And not a yeah, that's right. I was going to say, is that a is that deer? Or is that a Roethlisberger that you mistook for a, a deer or a squirrel? Yeah, I could see Ben Roethlisberger tanning. <laughs> <laughs> you probably could. I mean, the way you describe Pittsburgh, it sounds pretty compact. I'm I'm assuming you run into Pittsburgh Steelers quite fr- uh, you know frequently. Yeah, they just took. Three million people and kind of stuck them in between a series of hills. So we're all rubbing shoulders, and uh, it, it's a close knit community here. Well, speaking of close knit communities, uh, as always, we're underwritten by Mercy College of Health Science, and one of the things that we're hoping to produce a more close knit uh, community is we have the Faith and Healing series. But this is the fourth year that we've been doing it. You've been around for you were around for two of them, right? Yeah, I think this series has really taken off. Um, I, we've had we've brought some great people in from around the country. You have Adam Deville coming up, right? That's right. Tomorrow, you should. Oh, tomorrow. Yeah, you should. You should repost our interview. Yeah, no, we should do that. We should put that up on Facebook. Yeah, Adam, uh, Doctor Adam Deville. He is over at Fort Wayne State, Indiana. Uh, excuse me. He, no, St. Francis University in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Excuse me. Uh, so over just along the way, uh, he writes for Catholic World Report, the uh, you know the Ignatius Press <clears throat> website, all the time. Um, and like we like Bud was pointing out, we've had him on the show. He's going to be talking about Freud, alter egos, and dialogue. So the idea is, how is it that the Christian tradition um, spars with, interacts with? What can it learn in its engagement? with Freud, who I would think it's fair to say is often seen as antagonistic to Christianity, but it should be a fantastic talk. It's going to be at 6 o'clock tomorrow. We're going to have heavy hors d'oeuvres, uh, so 6 o'clock uh, at Sullivan Center um, at Mercy College. So, yeah, it's pretty exciting stuff. Yeah, and in all seriousness, um, uh, you know, theologically interested Catholics out there, I really encourage folks to get out. Um, you know, we've got this little gem of Mercy College in downtown Des Moines, and these events take place, and I don't think oftentimes everyone in the city realizes like just how substantive of a conversation is going to be taking place. I want to specifically call out Brian Jose Gonzalez. <laughs> that, uh, uh, we've, at- we've attended a few things he's organized in the past. So That's right. He, I feel like he should no be there. <laughs> yeah. Shots fired, Brian. I um, actually don't know his middle name. That was just a guess. Uh, <laughs> Probably offensive, but no. Um, also, as always, <laughs> underwritten by Cartridge World. So, Cartridge World, industry leader, delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time and money and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms. Business customers have pickup and delivery are available, and products are guaranteed or full replacement. That's Cartridge World, 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400, and online at cartridgeworld.com. Basketball's coming up, so we're going to have to go talk to Joe again about how, how he yeah. thinks that every, the old Big 8 is going to do. I'm sure this time of year, Joe is just kind of itching for basketball to start. And, you know, I don't know, does Kansas have a football team this year? Uh, they're not doing as bad as Baylor, but I, 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 I don't want to say this, bud, because, you know, we, you're not over here where I can look you deep in the eyes and say this, but uh. I don't know if Nebraska football fans can talk much this year. Is that fair to say? <laughs> what is this? Nebraska football, you speak of. No. I, uh, yeah, I'm not superstitious, but I'm a little stitious. And I, 
I feel like last week I really cursed my sports teams in general by ribbing Deacon Tony about the Cubs. Oh, yeah. The Cubs proceeded to sweep the Cardinals and pretty much eliminated our playoff hopes. So I'm glad this radio program is about Catholic social teaching. Right. Because I do not want a sports talk show this week. Yeah, no, uh, Deacon Tony is beaming more than usual. Uh, it's it's just shining through the the room has has gone up a few megawatts of energy with his 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 beautiful smile uh, as he <laughs> as he as he laughs uh, maniacally at how bad the Cardinals are now doing. I did, well, when I, I yeah when I said that about the Cubs, I forgot the prayer of a righteous man availeth much, and I know well Deacon Tony is a cleric, so that's right. Don't, yeah yeah. Uh oh. It's not nice to mess with Mother Nature. (laughs) (laughs) So you are now calling Mother Nature to your side now. Well, but uh, on a better topic, let's talk about what we're going to talk about today and uh, old friends we have. So uh, we're today is going to we're going to talk after the break. William English. He goes by Bill. I'm not going to be able to call him William. So Bill English. He's the assistant professor of strategy, economics, ethics, and public policy at the McDonough School of Business in Georgetown University. We went to grad school with him. We played interman- uh, intramural basketball with him. For me especially, he is he was one, uh, my sponsor when I came into the Catholic Church, and he's also uh, the godfather of Elias. Um, but he's been a busy man. He's been all over the place and uh, rightfully starting to hammer home what it means to be good citizens uh, to the Catholics out at Georgetown. So we're going to talk to him about his wheelhouse, which is everything about um, the common good and economics in terms of what does it mean for corporations or businesses to actually show civic mindedness? What does it mean for them to be good citizens? So I don't know, but this seems to me something that uh, ever present and, uh, and ever needs reminded for when we just look at the news and see the scandals and things that are happening. Yeah, I'm personally excited for this interview because I think um, Catholic social teaching, when it comes to economics, I talk to a lot of Catholics who they want to know more and adhere to Catholic teaching in this area, but it just feels like the questions are so big and so complex that sometimes it's difficult to know where to start. But I think Bill is the type of uh, thinker that can really help us along these lines. Well, we're, let's go ahead and hit to the break, and so we'll get back really quick with uh, Bill. No time wasted, and we'll let him dig deep into this subject. So this is The Uncommon Good. Stick around. We'll be back in a minute uh, with Bud and Bo. This is Father Bob Harris, pastor of All Saints Catholic Church in Des Moines, Iowa. Faith in Jesus Christ is so very important to me in my life, and there are so many ways that we have to increase our faith. One of them is prayer. That's where we kind of start. We start with a very strong prayer life, and it helps us increase our faith. And there are so many other ways. What you're listening to right here at Catholic Radio can certainly help you increase your faith and have a firmer foundation. And so I encourage all of you to pray, and when you have a chance to listen to the Catholic Radio station, God bless. Established in Des Moines in 1924, St. Vincent de Paul's assists those living in poverty to become self-sufficient by helping to remove roadblocks on their journey out of poverty. With two thrift stores, a social services department, and an education center, St. Vincent de Paul served over 10,200 clients last year. All of their services are funded by local donations, grants, and sales from their thrift stores. SVDPDSM.org, 515-282-8327. This message is brought to you by Homemakers Furniture. Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available. Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts. 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400 and online at cartridgeworld.com. Here is your forecast on Iowa Catholic Radio. Warming things up this afternoon to the mid to upper 80s with a good deal of sunshine. Now, we do have a boundary crossing our area late tonight and into our Thursday. A few pop-up showers and thunderstorms with it. Overnight low 65 and our Thursday high back to the upper 80s. Sunny, breezy, and hotter Friday, the high low 90s. The weather is brought to you by Divine Treasure Catholic Book and Gift Store, celebrating 25 years of service to the greater Des Moines community. I'm Jennifer Naramore on Iowa Catholic Radio. We're back with the Uncommon Good, Bob Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr. Just a reminder, next week we have our Catholic Carathon. 
And so if you want to hear the best begging in town, tune in. They're going to have me on more than once, and I will I will tug at your heartstrings, and you will be a part of our ministry. So at any rate, that's next week. For this week, <laughs> we have a special guest with us today, William English. I know him as Bill. Bill English, Assistant Professor Strategy of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University. My personal friend, the person who helped me go come into the church as my sponsor, the Godfather of Elias. Bill, it is wonderful to have you on the radio. How you doing? Hello, Bo. Good to be here. Thanks for having me. Yeah, how is D.C.? We, we've been talking about the weather and how uh, squirrels and uh, deer are confused everywhere. Uh, what, what's going on at D.C. with the weather? Yeah, well, here in the swamp, uh, you know, we still have pretty high humidity. Hopefully that goes away at some point this fall. Um, otherwise, though, it's, it's a temperate climate, and uh, having lived in Boston for the last five years, uh, we're looking forward to the winters of D.C. a little bit more. Oh, yeah. Uh, once you make it past the summer and the humidity, it's not so bad here. That's true. All the hot air there. hey No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, uh, Bill, you, ha- you you write about a lot. You you are a prolific uh, researcher, a writer. Um, you, you were talking about just coming from Boston. You worked at the uh, – well, I don't want to mess it up there – the ethics uh, – well, well, can you say what it was? At, at- yeah, yes. I, I spent I, uh, five – was very blessed to spend five years at uh, Harvard's Ethics Center, the yeah. Edmund J. Saffer Center for Ethics. So you've done and a lot we were of doing research. A... Go ahead. This... Yeah, yeah. So we, we had this research project that went on for five years, and the, the entire theme of it was what we called institutional corruption. And the idea was, you know, this is after the financial crisis. You see all these very large, important institutions across our society that seem to have failed in radical ways. And we were trying to understand, you know, what went wrong, how did it fail, and the intuition at the beginning was there might be some instances of, of people who wanted to be evil, of, you know, intentional wrongdoing, but we also suspected there was a lot of good souls trapped in bad institutions, trapped in bad games, where uh, they didn't intentionally want to do wrong, but you'd have conflicts of interest or, uh, you know, various incentive problems or psychological biases or difficulties with accountability and responsibility that end up aggregating up to these terrible outcomes. So I was part of a, a research team there that uh, spent uh, five years looking at all sorts of different institutions from medicine and finance to politics throughout our society, trying to understand uh, peculiar failures and uh, think about what we could do differently to prevent them. Yeah, and I, I think when people go like, oh, wow, so this is this big you know, research, this is this sort of egg-heady, this is like you know, Harvard's doing it. But then immediately one thinks, what was it, just last week or so, that we hear that Equifax, which is someone who basically has information on every single one of the credit scores of the people of the United States, uh, let's just say if they didn't behave, like you said, blatantly, evilly, they at least had some uh, horrible lapses of judgment that even if you're going to imagine that like a, a moral person who's good otherwise um, helped pull into these things, and there must be something systematically that allows people to be, I guess what you would say is like, frankly and flagrantly negligent um, with important matters. So it seems that this is an ever-pressing issue. How do we make sure people that we hand a lot of um, a lot of our information and our trust to, what are we going to do to set up a better world uh, so that the common good allows them to be governed by better principles? And I, my guess is that that's exactly the sort of um, issues that you're trying to broach. Yeah, yeah. We are willing to joke that we were we had no shortage of field research opportunities, and uh, <laughs> the world kept giving us more and more things to to understand and look at. And by by no means do I think uh, you know these problems are close to being solved. But I do think we we had a lot of insights as to what's been going on and the nature of the problem. And, and Equifax actually, it's, it's interesting. It simplifies a lot of the problems we saw across different industries. So Equifax, here's an example of a company that uh, is very large. Uh, it's grown tremendously over the last few decades, and there were a lot of reasons for it to grow large. There were all these efficiencies to be had when you could uh, centralize data, help coordinate uh, security access across the economy. So it's, it's performing a valuable function in our economy. Uh, it's doing so, you know, reaping magnitudes of uh, scale as it grows larger, becoming efficient. Uh, but then you get in a situation where it has this enormous amount of power. It oversees this incredibly important in, uh, range of data. Um, and we are all trusting on the, exec- in the executives and the people that run that company to do a good job. 
but it's also a company that has this a, a, a highly concentrated industry now. It's something we all have to use. It uh, has healthy profits. Um, and the incentives working inside that company uh, looks like they weren't keeping people on their toes. So one example of that, I, it's been reported in the media, and I don't know uh, all the details of it, but apparently their chief security officer is somebody who had absolutely no background in uh, information technology, computer science, uh, I believe she was a music major uh, and maybe has a, held a master's in music composition. Uh, and so you have a question of, you know, the qualifications of the people who are at the top uh, to actually oversee security and uh, a question as to why why should we actually trust them? Why do they have the competencies to execute the kind of tasks and trust we place in them? Uh, and then when, a, you know, Again, I don't think it was. Just, I don't think anyone at the top intended this to happen. I don't think they wanted this to happen. But the term negligence you use, uh, I think, is probably an accurate way to describe what likely went on at the level of psychology. Um, and the overall problem. I mean, the, what I what I would characterize as, as how this problem manifests itself across our economy is you have organizations that grow larger and larger, and there are economic reasons that they should become large because there's all these efficiencies associated with it. But we haven't at the same time grown mechanisms of accountability, grown practices of responsibility within those organizations to help keep people accountable. Uh, And so you could imagine, you know, 50 years ago, you might have a doctor and the doctor is a local doctor in your town. You know the doctor. They know your family. Uh, Today, you go in the healthcare system. You you go to hospital. You might see many different doctors. You don't know them on a personal level. You're interacting with uh, different people who take the bills, different people who put you to specialists. So there's all, all the personal relationships that used to characterize your engagement with healthcare care uh, now have been withered away. So you, you, engage, you engage with a system rather than engaging with a person. And it used to be we knew what was expected of people and we knew what was expected of relationships. And where there were certain moral norms and responsibilities that uh, were transparent, obvious, and clear in those personal contexts. But when we move to big institutional contexts and organizational contexts, those sorts of personal bonds, personal connections, personal relationships, and the moral obligations that are, you know, obviously accompany them are, are now wither away, and you engage with a system. And if the system has something, has a glitch, has a problem with it, all of a sudden, not only does it affect you, but it affects everyone in the system. Everyone uh, suffers the consequences. And oftentimes, the people who are responsible for overseeing that uh, process uh, either walk away with a retirement or, you know, just get fired or do their own thing. But it, it's an unfortunate system that I think a lot of our large institutions have not yet evolved the kind of uh, senses of responsibility and the mechanisms to actually help keep people accountable that we really need in the economy um, so that the gains, the economic gains from large organizations are actually matched with a kind of uh, moral quality of their actual responsiveness to customers or actual care for uh, the tasks they do. And until we do that, then it's hard to actually justify the trust that we place in a lot of these large institutions. Bill, thanks for being with us. This is Bud. Um, stepping back for a moment, I know this this next one is kind of a broad question, but I was wondering if you could provide our listeners with kind of a brief overview of some of the important things that the church has said about economics generally. Um, because I know when we critique some facets of our economy, some people might think, well, these guys, you know, hate free markets. But the church's teaching has been a bit more nuanced than that, right? Oh, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, I mean, the church, I think, is exemplary on this. Uh, uh, so it has this rich Catholic social and cyclical tradition going back to Rerum Novarum. Um, uh, they're on new things. And it's, you know, the, the Pope's commenting uh, sort of the height of industrialism in Europe on all sorts of social issues that arise. And uh, I think one thing that, that people both on the right and the left agree on, I mean, Marx agrees on this, Joseph Schumpeter and Milton Friedman agree on this, is that markets entail what Schumpeter calls creative destruction. They, they do dislocate people. They, uh, you know, they end old industries, they create new industries. And the, the church was one of the, uh, the you know, first a set of major social commentators to think deeply and hardly about the economic transitions that accompanied industrialism in the late 19th century and uh, continued throughout the 20th century. The church continued to write on and reflect on the social problems and economic problems uh, uh, that 
our world and globe are going through. So I think the uh, you know, it's to the church's great credit that that they uh, sought to think through these issues systematically. Um, and certainly, you know, by the end of the 20th century, John Paul II writes uh, in Chesimus Anus, um, it's, it's a very I'd say they're very appreciative of markets and their role in the society and the importance they have, the allocative efficiency and, and benefits market economies have, and the importance of freedom as an underlying principle, but also still wrestling with, you know, what are all the, uh, first of all, what are the social contexts in which markets operate? Uh, and in fact, it, it's suggested there that actually the larger cultural background of an economy matters. Uh, and then there's all sorts of questions about, uh, you know, how a market economy, how a market society ought to deal with the various dislocations that uh, arise in the context of a dynamic economy. So you know, the Church has a, has a tremendous history of thinking about these things. I, I will note it's both a strength and the weakness of the encyclical tradition that it, it, it stays as a, at a level of, I'd say, principles and generality, and I think quite rightly doesn't often get into the weeds of economic policy, and, and you know, the, the Church leaders aren't economists. Uh, so what they give us is, I think, a, a lot of uh, guideposts, uh, principles, and uh, observations and insights and concerns. And uh, then it's often up to the actual practitioners in the field to, to think through what are the implications of that in this time and place? What sort of policies, what sort of procedures, what sort of uh, you know business operations would live up to these ideals and principles? Um, but that's a, it's, it's a great tradition that the Catholic Church has sort of given to us and that we, we think within. This is The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr coming to you on Iowa Catholic Radio from Mercy Live Up Studios. We're speaking with Dr. Bill English all the way out from Georgetown Way, and we're talking about uh, church, the economy, the common good, and how um, maybe modern or even contemporary distrust in things like large institutions, how the common good can help us navigate those scenarios. Bill, that was a wonderful way to sum up uh, the the background of, of what we're working from, that we have principles given to us to think through these difficult situations. What comes to mind, um, we can talk about the distrust like the sort of common man has, that you you hear things like Equifax all the way back to Enron and even further back. Uh, 2008, I think, is stuck in many people's minds, um, the economic downturn and everything like this. And people, you know, there's always this sense of why are we always caught one step behind? Like it's always, oh my goodness, here we are, uh, you know, all of this just happened, and now we're having these conversations. What sort of um, possibilities or, or or unique things we might be able to pull off in the future could allow us to start having these conversations before the crash, before the thing shrinks, before the bad news happens? Is there any tools in the tradition that we could say would allow us to be preventative rather than um, just summarizing something that's just happened to us? Yeah, yeah. I mean, this is a great challenge. I think a, a lot of our, often our policy responses and our public debates, they're they're dealing with the last crisis. And, uh, you know, people end up having very thoughtful, subtle explanations for what already happened. But as you say, the real challenge is going forward. And this is actually a, a big focus of ours at the Ethics Center at Harvard, was trying to develop practical tools to help uh, companies, organizations deal proactively with these problems. Uh, it's interesting. One of I think one of the challenges that large organizations have is a, a challenge of getting information to the people that actually need it to help the organization be accountable. So uh, particularly, you know, you think of complex industries like pharmaceutical companies or finance, and uh, in retrospect, it turns out there's, there are always people on the inside, you, you see this in the financial crisis, who said, you know, writing memos at layman a year and a half before it goes bankrupt to say, I think what's going on here is crazy. There's there's practices that don't make sense. Same thing at Enron. You have memos being written saying, uh, you know, I think we have uh, we're about to go down in a mountain of uh, accounting scandals. Uh, so there was actually information on the inside that certain people had that should have raised warning signs, that should have raised red flags. Uh, one set of reforms I think have actually been pretty promising are to try to provide mechanisms for these sorts of people to make this information known. So these are so-called whistleblower uh, policies and provisions. And uh, there were some reforms with Sarbanes-Oxley and uh, later with the, the legislation uh, Dodd-Frank that try to mandate certain corporate whistleblower programs. I think these are sometimes uh, you know, a little cookie-cutter and not terribly effective. But there have been 
some very interesting programs in the last five years where the government will actually pay whistleblowers um, if they disclose any sort of fraud or tax evasion. Uh, the whistleblower actually gets a portion of the damages that the government recoups. And we've had some very, very large uh, and interesting claims coming out of that process right now. Uh, and it, it ends up being, at the end of the day, good people within an organization that see something that they know is fishy and know is wrong and are able to either within the organization uh, bring it up to the, the proper chain of command or, if needed, go outside the organization and get the appropriate authorities uh, to draw their attention to it. Um, that seems to me one of one of the big challenges, but something that we're we're getting a little bit better at, and will hopefully prevent uh, some of the similar sorts of catastrophes in the future. But uh, I think you know, a lot of different proposals people make. The the trouble is really to think prospectively and not just uh, focus on whatever the one problem was in the last crisis and think if you address that, you address everything. Bill, what we're talking about this morning uh, seems to it, it impinged in significant ways on the last presidential election. And, you know, one diagnosis of uh, Hillary Clinton's loss is that she sort of ignored the plight of blue-collar workers in the Rust Belt, etc. Um, in, in past history, especially American history, the church has been seen to be in significant ways on the side of laborers. But I, I've heard some friends uh, kind of dismissively say things like, look, blue-collar jobs are just gone forever, and, and you know, working-class citizens are just going to have to adjust to a new reality what, what do we say in response to comments like that? Like, have we moved to an era with a completely different kind of economy? Yeah, this is all really interesting. And I think you talk about the, the questions everybody are wrestling with for the next few decades. Uh, these issues are front and center. I had some colleagues at Georgetown that did some incredible econometric work before the election where they were looking at, uh, they were able to look at every voting district in the United States and also get data on the industries people were employed there and the degree to which these industries were affected by globalization. And when they crunched this data, they were able to, this was three months before the election, they said, look, uh, if you look at historical economic models of voting and you look at where these uh, people are working who have been adversely affected by globalization, um, if they vote for the party that's not in power, then Donald Trump wins. And they were saying this when everybody else uh, thought it was absolutely, in, you know, Trump had no chance. And as you said, he did quite well in, in uh, places where people, where Hillary Clinton didn't even think to campaign, but for economic reasons, uh, uh, people seem to be very anxious about Hillary Clinton's uh, you know, economic platform and what it meant for them. There was a question, I, there's a double-edged sword here, and that's that on the one hand, as I said, the economy, dynamic economies, market economies do create new jobs, do destroy old jobs. And we're going through uh, some major technological, major technological changes. I think the challenge is not to try to halt that process or think that by not engaging in trade, we somehow are going to make everything better. But really the challenge is to focus on the creation side. How, where are new, where, what sort of new jobs are going to come? How do we get people educated for them, including people who have been in, in other careers so far, uh, I asked my students, I put this slide on the board, and it's always interesting to see their reactions. First, I asked them, uh, what country in the, in the world produces uh, the most manufactured good? The most, what, what country has the most manufacturing? And after some debate, and go back, they go back and forth, and it, it comes down to them. They think it's either China or the United States. Um, and those are, those are actually both good guesses. It used to be the United States until a few years ago. It looks like China recently uh, edged us out, something like $2.5 trillion worth of manufacturing goods. I then asked them, which country in the world has lost the most manufacturing jobs in the last 10 years? And they think about it, uh, and it turns out the answer to this, and it's surprising, is China. And I show them a picture of a Chinese factory from the late 90s, and there's people everywhere. It's a textile uh, uh, mill, and there's people everywhere on this floor. And I show them a picture of a similar textile mill today, and it's just covered with machines with two or three people checking in on them. And it's amazing that, that China has actually lost, uh, by an order of magnitude, more manufacturing jobs over this period because of this underlying issue, technology. Uh, so the question is, if technology you know, has its uses, it makes us more productive on some fronts, um, but what do we do with the, the human capital? What do we do with labor? How do we uh, reorient people for jobs 
uh, that are going to be more valuable and productive. And that seems to me this enormous challenge, and it's a challenge both of education, um, and it's also a challenge of what sort of mechanisms of uh, uh, support do we offer people. So there's a big, lively debate right now about minimum income guarantees. Should we provide everyone in our economy a certain uh, level to maintain a, a minimum standard of living? Um, not even conditional on, on many other background questions. Just uh, if you're a person, a United States citizen, you get a certain amount of money. Um, and if you earn more than that, it slowly that subsidy slowly goes away. And the argument that this this might be vitally important to, to help people deal with these dislocations of a new economy, or is this is there something actually you know deeply strange and inhuman about being paid not to work? Is this going to change mores and attitudes? Uh, understandings of what it means to be a virtuous citizen. I think these are really interesting debates, and I'd be curious to, to hear your thoughts on them. Um, they're going to be with us for a long time to come, and I think uh, are going to dominate a lot of the economic conversations we have. Oh, those are fascinating, Bill. And actually, if you don't mind sticking around, we're going to take our uh, half hour uh, the at the half hour break. So we'll be back in about two minutes. Sure. Yeah, you can stick around, and we'll we'll get into that other issues as well. This has been a fascinating talk. So, well, friends of the Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr from Iowa Catholic Radio from Mercy Live Up Studios. We'll be back after the break. Thank you for listening to the Uncommon Good, brought to you by Mercy College of Health Sciences, Des Moines' only downtown Catholic college, serving students going into the health fields of Iowa and beyond. Please join us on Thursday, September 21st at 6 p.m. for our first Faith and Healing Speaker of the Year. Dr. Adam DeVille will kick off our series with three more coming through the rest of the academic year. The registration page is online at mchs.edu slash faith and healing. Mercy College of Health Sciences, underwriting the uncommon good. Established in Des Moines in 1924, St. Vincent de Paul's assists those living in poverty to become self-sufficient by helping to remove roadblocks on their journey out of poverty. With two thrift stores, a social services department, and an education center, St. Vincent de Paul served over 10,200 clients last year. All of their services are funded by local donations, grants, and sales from their thrift stores. SVDPDSM.org, 515-282-8327. This message is brought to you by Homemakers Furniture. Jeb, what do you mean, what am I doing next week? That's frankly rude. Uh, that's, oh, you're right, Deacon Tony, next week is Fall Carathon. Folks, whoever knew begging for money and writing checks could be so much fun, but every time we do this, I'm amazed at your generosity and the joy of your giving hearts. And besides, I heard Jeb say he doesn't think we can beat last time's mark. Let's prove Jeb wrong. Fall Carathon, next week. Boom! Support for The Uncommon Good is provided by Cartridge World. Cartridge World is an industry leader delivering high-performance printing products that help you save time, money, and print great. Perfect for businesses, home offices, college students, or busy moms trying to find affordable printing supplies including ink, toner, paper, or printers. For business customers, pickup and delivery are available. Products are guaranteed or full replacement. Cartridge World, your low-cost, environmentally friendly printing experts. 801 73rd Street in Windsor Heights, 515-564-7400 and online at cartridgeworld.com. We're back with the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr coming to you from the iowacatholicradio.com, the Mercy Live Up Studios. And just a quick reminder, next week we have the Carathon. We'd love you to be a part of it. Today we are speaking with Dr. Bill English, Assistant Professor of Strategy, Economics, Ethics, and Public Policy at the McDonough School of Business at Georgetown University, speaking about a whole range of issues, but primarily about how the common good might govern um, our economic life together. Bill, thank you for joining us back on the show. Great to be here. So you brought up really interesting questions, even throwing out, you would love to hear from me. I always try to be a bit coy on the radio because... Bill, I want to keep my job as long as possible. No, I'm kidding. Um, you bring up interesting questions about what are we going to do about the creative destruction that markets um, what they do. And so I only throw out, and, and you're right, like one of the things that's nice about the encyclical tradition is, like you said, they talk about the order of principles and they try not to act like they have um, more empirical science to work on than they do. So myself, I'm not an economist. I can barely do math. I'm probably easy to steal money from because I'm from Oklahoma. But principle-wise, what I want to throw out is only this. One of the interesting things in Rerum Novarum is that you have Leo XIII talk about um, the good 
of things like unions, that labors can come together, that labor can come together, and that they have not only a right but a, a good, and he, hearkening back to the medieval guilds, of sort of having a community themselves being able to talk with people who own capital, who own the means of production, and all these things like this. So for me, it's always interesting to say, how do we imagine that in 2017 in a globalized market where, like you said, robots coming down the chute might replace jobs that my dad had or my granddad had? And what does that begin to look like? Because it's, it's obviously silly to act like we could have what Leo the Thirteenth was thinking of in the 1800s, early 1900s. In 2017, what does that look like today that workers um, don't feel alienated from what they do? And I think it's fair to say many people feel that way. If they're always feeling like there's some robot on the horizon replacing what they're going to do, the question starts to be how is it that um, workers don't have to be just individuals, but there's a real way in which they can be part of a group that, in so to speak, owns their labor. So that would be the concern I have, and I wonder... Um, in your research, if you come across anything that speaks to that. Yeah, and I think you touch on there, I think, both alienation, this question of when you're at work, you know, and Adam Smith said, look, division of labor is a great thing, but it also, it can uh, lessen our human capacities. If all you do is every day long is, all day long is stand on a production line and put the head of a pin on a pin shaft, um, you're not exercising your full creative human capacities. So this is a traditional concern of, of a lot of economic life is, you know, we, we put in our whatever it is, eight hours a day, and during those eight hours, we may not really like what we're doing, uh, but we're able to go home and we have a life outside of work and we use uh, the resources, uh, uh, the money we get from a salary and, and support our family and do things with our community. Um, so there's, a, there's, I think, a traditional question about, you know, can we do things at work and within work that make it more humanly fulfilling and humane? Uh, and then you also mentioned the anxiety of even if I have a job uh, that is good and, and good for me and my family, how do I know it's not going to go away in a few years? Uh, how do I position myself? And does that also just not create a, a kind of constant fear and dread and need to be retooling myself that, that becomes destructive uh, uh, over time as well? The uh, On alienation, I'm, I'm reminded there's a famous George Carlin joke, and he says, oh, you, you don't like your job. You know, there's a support group for that. It's called Everyone, and it meets at the bar. <laughs> and, uh, you know, his, his point is, yes, this, this, I think that's a, a, a permanent feature of probably a human life is we, we do things, you know, by definition, a lot of work uh, is something that we do partly because we're renew, remu, uh, remunerated for it. And, and that's something that I think we should try to humanize the work, and that's something that, that entrepreneurs um, and I'd say a lot of HR, you know, human resource professionals very much are trying to do within companies today is find out ways to make the work environment more conducive to human flourishing. And that's something, uh, you know, organization by organization basis uh, sometimes needs to be worked out. Um, I think the question you raise, I think you raise a much deeper set of questions broadly in our society. And that is, uh, do we have the social conditions, uh, both within and outside of work, uh, to develop meaningful lives and communion with others. And this, I think, that there's, the labor unions is a, is a piece of a larger puzzle. Uh, Rob Putnam at, at Harvard a few years ago had this book called Bowling Alone, where he noted that uh, there's more and more people bowling today than there were in 1950, but there's far fewer bowling clubs, bowling leagues, people bowling together as a social activity. And this was a metaphor for all sorts of um, civic social associations that he saw it as being in decline. And I think unions are a, a part and parcel of that. We have record low unionization today. I also think the background economy has changed so that the uh, the, the needs of unions and the power of unions um, is probably a slightly different circumstance. But I think, yeah, there's, there's a vital necessity and, and importance to developing forms of solidarity within work life. And this is particularly true when you think about the gig economy. So more and more people, they aren't going to an office where they, you know, at least meet with friends and talk at the water cooler. Uh, they're working online, maybe doing programming for gigs where they, they get a certain amount in exchange for a certain uh, product or certain labor output. You can imagine Uber, Uber drivers or Lyft drivers. They just, you know, start their shift whenever they want, get paid by the hour and turn the clock off when they're done. Um, and, but these are very solitary enterprises, very lonely enterprises. So I think you know, one of the challenges, economic challenges we have, are how do we have developed forms of uh, solidarity and community that help provide 
you know, meaning, encouragement, uh, uh, friendship in the context of our working lives. Uh, and that's something that I think ultimately has to be sort of a grassroots effort. That's something that, that uh, individuals, people on the ground, local communities uh, sort of have to figure out on their self, but I think uh, on their own. But I think that's a great to call people's attention to the, the value and importance of that. You're listening to The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Bud Marr on Iowa Catholic Radio. We're talking this morning with Bill English, Dr. Bill English, a political economist, economist I'm sorry, at Georgetown University. And, Bill, I have to say, I just have to pause for a moment and say it's great to have you with us because, uh, you know, um, Bo got to ask a question that involved the threat of robots taking over. So you really are scratching an itch that he has. <laughs> it's, a, it's a common theme in the classroom and on the radio. Um, but so, so some of these problems that, you, that we're talking about, say, like corruption and, and mortgage lending or something, those can really only be addressed at a large scale. But when you were talking about unions a moment ago, I was thinking about the principle of subsidiarity and, you know, ways that Catholics can think about living differently at sort of a local level. And what came to mind for me was something akin to the medieval guilds or confraternities. And it seems to me that no matter where our economy heads, that we need to think of ways that members of the church can sort of organize their communal life that makes sure that the weaker members don't fall through the cracks. I don't know, do you, do you think I'm being an idealist here? Is there something like the medieval guilds that's possible in our day and age, yeah, no, I think I think this is a uh, I think the, the underlying aspiration is a really valid one. It's something that I think actually happens in practice, particularly at say the level of a parish, uh, where you know you actually get to know people, uh, know families, know individuals, know people who are hard on their luck, know people that need help, uh, they pool resources. I think the I think the, the bigger question is how to do this at a more uh, systemic level, and this is where there's a, a sort of trade-off between, on the one hand. You know, the principle of subsidiarity suggests that uh, this is a sort of more a, a grassroots thing. Um, on the other hand, people say if it's if it's left up to the grassroots, if it's just every local community needs to figure it out for themselves, uh, there's a lot that won't, and people will fall through the cracks. And so then they look to more, you know, can we have systematic programs, publicly supported programs, government programs uh, that help provide resources and support and identify people. And uh, I think it's healthy to have both in our society. Uh, it will be interesting to me as these debates about guaranteed minimum income uh, develop to see to see the kind of proposals that come out. I mean, very specifically, I mean, we have, there are proposals that say give everyone in the United States twenty thousand dollars, and uh, that's if you earn more on the side, that slowly gets uh, tapered down as your income goes to forty or fifty thousand dollars, perhaps. Um, but that would create very different norms. So if somebody, you see somebody who is in poverty, you say, what happened to the money you got? Why, why didn't you spend that better? Uh, and it strikes me that there's, there will still be a need, even if we address some basic material uh, resource issues, for all sorts of forms of ministry to, to provide support and, and mercy and help to all sorts of forms of uh, people who become, whether it's through their own fault or others, uh, less fortunate and in need. Um, so th this is a large landscape. I think there's a, an enormous amount that can be done at the local level. And uh, at the local level, we often need to reinvigorate the call and the importance for doing that sort of stuff. Uh, at the policy level, at the more governmental level, I think we're going to have to think through a, a lot of different proposals for how we might target aid uh, and do so in ways that actually promote the development of human beings and don't lead to things like dependency and despair and, uh, you know, a lack of work ethic. Uh, so those are very difficult questions at a policy level. But at the local level, people actually know people, and you can often get the, I think, the, the most attentive, appropriate responses formulated. And that's where the principal subsidiarity, I think, is uh, really on to something in terms of the, uh, the, the, most, the greatest value that you can get from this sort of care is typically at that, uh, the lowest subsidiary level. Bill, I think that you bring up um, a sort of underlying point that sometimes people forget. We we really want things to be easy. We want to say, like, well, either you need government in intervention or you don't, or either it needs to be local or you don't. We forget that, of course, you can basically mess up everything. Like, humans are – that's one of our great talents is no matter where we find ourselves, we can do it poorly. I saw a joke on the Internet that said, you know, under communism – 
you uh, you buy everything from the state, and under developed capitalism, you buy everything from Amazon. Now, of course, that's like overlooking all sorts of n- niceties. I'm not, but it's still just Amazon a funny... actually has stuff, and you get it delivered. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's still it's still a funny joke to make the joke, but the idea of like, can we end up be having like a monad either way? Sure. And so one of the things that's really important to po- important to point out is that when we consider these things, it's not just that like you were pointing out, that aid is good, there's better and worse aid. There's better and worse ways to intervene on behalf of people that need help. I think of this in terms of the role of the government. So when we start talking about policy issues and solidarity, how is it that issues that need to be uh, uh, taken care of or addressed at a governmental level, how do we do so? And there's all sorts of ways that the government can get involved in the economy without it being a central planning economy. I mean, I think that's one people sometimes forget is if you say that the government should have a role in economics like the uh, encyclical tradition the Catholic Church does, it doesn't mean that the government needs to plan out the economy. You were bringing up a very interesting example, right, where whistleblowers will get remunerated by what the government recovers in a lawsuit. That's the government doing its job, doing something about economics. And I think sometimes that's what we need to remember is that we don't have to fall into the easy left-right categories talking about the economy that are on the table. If if the economy allows for creative destruction and creation, ideas work that way too. And maybe what we have to allow ourselves to do is think creatively about how can the government be involved in the economy without it being some sort of character of a central planned economy. Yeah, I think you're, you're right to draw attention to the, the nuance that needs to happen when we think about the, the role of government. Um, we have all sorts of examples of the government being heavy-handed, the government uh, destroying wealth, the government doing very perverse things. Uh, it's also the case, though, that the, the rule of law is a really important uh, precondition for a lot of markets to, to work well. Um, uh, and there's a lot of regulatory frameworks and legal frameworks that, that really are important for creating an environment for businesses to flourish, for markets to work. So there, you know, there's a delicate, and it's, it's a complicated, you know, nuanced distinctions may be made about uh, the role of good regulation, the role of good law and order, um, and uh, and the role of you know various sorts of provisions of uh, of assistance, of tax policy, uh, to encourage you know the overall the best material circumstances for people to to develop, flourish, and do well. Uh, it was interesting to me. I said a, a slightly related note. I just saw an article. I think it was from Sweden that uh, Sweden's facing a huge demographic implosion. They are, their birth rate is around 1.5, 1.57. And one of the things this article noted is, you know, Sweden consistently ranks as one of the best places in the world to raise a child. Uh, they have tremendous public assistance, uh, tremendous welfare programs. Uh, you know, you have parental and rental, uh, uh, parental leave, uh, maternal leave programs. Uh, it's ext- they've gone to extraordinary lengths to make it. A materially very very easy to have ample resources uh, for couples to use towards raising children, uh, despite all these economic interventions, despite making uh, material resources available, they're still not getting the fertility rates that they hoped they would. And uh, the article was dancing around that there you know there are deeper cultural issues for this, and you know cha- you know all sorts of changes going on in the background. And this it just struck me is there's a famous political theorist, uh, Peter Augustine Lawler, who recently, recently passed away. And uh, Lawler had this uh, phrase, he said, you know, despite all these attempts to, to make ourselves comfortable, to, to sort of design a mechanism for everything, to make it pay to be good, he says at the end of the day, we're stuck with virtue. Uh, despite all, you know, we can do a lot of things on all these other dimensions, but we're still kind of stuck with virtue. And I think that's that's true of a lot of these economic questions. We we should try to creatively, uh, you know, enhance our material resources, you know, create more capacity for people to have things and do things. But there's also a, an uh, irreducible human element to all of this, and we also need good people along with good institutions and good laws. Bill, I'll be honest. Some of these topics this morning are are a bit outside of my own wheelhouse, but I've. I've researched a great deal on the development of doctrine, and in that field, you'll sometimes hear theologians, like more liberal theologians, point to the Church's teaching on usury, uh, uh, lending that interest as a sort of like a preeminent example of uh, an evolutionary understanding of doctrinal development. 
Um, I know this is, again, this is sort of broad, but has the church changed its teaching on usury? And if so, like, what implications does this have for, for church life more generally? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. So you, you had this period, and it raises all these questions of, yeah, development of doctrine, but also development of the background conditions of society. So, uh, you know, going back to Aristotle, there's, a, there's an ancient suspicion of money lending, and the argument is that uh, money is you know, so-called infertile. What, if, if you lend money out, you're giving this thing to somebody else. Why should they have to give you more back? And part of the reason that that understanding is dominant is for most of human history, you actually don't have economies with sustained growth rates. So they're, they're, if you think about the background uh, interest rate of society, the background growth rate of an economy, these economies are, are generally agricultural economies. They're fairly stagnant. They go through booms and busts depending on weather. Uh, you know, you do get trade routes that develop in, in ancient Rome and medieval Europe. But overall, I mean, we, we, you're not having societies char- uh, characterized by 2 or 3% GDP growth rates per year. Which makes the which does make the idea of interest uh, suspect uh, because with in a low interest and a low growth rate situation you shouldn't be paying a lot to to lend money to uh, get money uh, on a loan. So it, the church's teaching made sense in low growth economies to be suspicious of uh, exorbitant uh, money lending rates, uh, but we enter a really different period once you get to the start of modern economy 300 or so years ago. Uh, where all of a sudden there, there's a totally transparent, legitimate rationale for lending money because money is capital, it's resources that can be deployed to actually be productive, that productivity you know, yields a gain, yields a return. And so if I'm giving money to somebody else, I'm foregoing an opportunity for myself. So there, it, it's precisely because of the changing background economic conditions that uh, it becomes more obvious and apparent when it's legitimate to, to lend money. And so this is an area where yeah, the, the church today certainly doesn't think um, it's wrong to charge interest, but uh, their, their underlying uh, insight or principle that there is such a thing as exorbitant interest, there is such a thing as taking advantage, uh, and that is still understood to be uh, problematic and, and not good. But where, you, where that line gets drawn uh, is going to be different based on the background economic conditions of that society. So it, it is. It's a fantastic historical example, I think, of how you know the background economic realities have created conditions that mean the underlying sort of principle. The principle still applies, but the, the way we see it manifest is going to be different because it's, it's a different circumstance. Well, Bill, we've covered a whole host of topics, and it's been fantastic. On that last point alone, I think we could talk for an hour about you know how do we determine. Um, like you said, uh, how does the principle apply? How does something, you know, spill over, so to speak, into usury in the modern world? It would involve a lot of math. Uh, we could make, you know, subsequent points about um, when people look at the churches uh, applying the principle differently, they then, you know, take that to mean that anything goes, and certainly the church isn't saying that. I mean, I think this applies in nearly everything we've said is that what we need is people who are willing uh, to be virtuous, you said we're stuck with virtue, to be virtuous about precision, prudence, and actually willing to have the argument. And I know one of the things we bemoan here on The Uncommon Good is a lot of times these end up being shouting matches instead of people using um, the, their, their, their minds and their convictions to really sort of get at what is actually the issue. And so I want to say thank you for coming on the show and being a good example about what that might look like. Well, it's uh, been great to talk through things with you all today, and uh, delighted uh, the show's had so much success. Always happy to come back on uh, if you ever want to chat some more. Uh, we'll have you back on because uh, you're going to be uh, the Faith and Healing series, which we have tomorrow. You're going to be at one of those uh, next semester in the spring. This is true, yes. I can't wait to come out and visit. So if you guys enjoyed this talk, uh, go on to mchs.edu. Uh, you can go look at our Faith and Healing series, and you can look up not only what's the talk for tomorrow, but when Bill's going to be back in town. So yeah, Bill English, uh, professor out there at Georgetown. Thank you so much for joining the show today. Thank you, Bo and Bud. Thanks. Well, Bud, um, that's about the extent you and I can talk about money without someone robbing us blind, I think. Yeah, no, I feel like we're, we've got some real momentum with interviews. You know, Mike Vasquez last week was great, and this one... It's another interview where I was taking a lot of notes myself, and it's kind of nice to have some shots fired at both robots and, you know, 
misunderstandings about the development of doctrine. So that's good. Someday when the Cubs are replaced by robot baseball players instead of actual humans, um, it's going to be really easy for me to uh, just dislike all of them. So dislike robots, dislike the Cubs. It's going to work out someday, bud. Well, I'm pretty sure the owners there, I forget the brother's name, they, they are robots. Because if, <laughs> if you can help the Red Sox and the Cubs win a World oh, Series. Oh, the Epsteins, yeah. <laughs> the, yeah, there must be something more there. Um, yeah. No, but all this talk about money, you know, uh, it brings me back to, um, like you said, you and I are probably, we, we won't give personal advice on this sort of thing, but we turn to people like Bill or um, Gary Anderson at Notre Dame, and, and Anderson has really walked through the Bible and shown that, you know, when we give money for the things of God, especially almsgiving, that um, the, the interest, so to speak, is beyond our imagination. Like, on earth we can get small small payments and we're to use our money wisely, but when we give to those in need, that has an eternal reward attached to it. So after your almsgiving, though, please also remember the station. I know next week is our is our carathon, and so you'll hear more of this, but to continue the, the wonderful ministries we, hit, we have here at Iowa Catholic Radio. Right. I, you know, we're not in need, need. Like, I think uh, I just had some coffee. I think I saw uh, Jeb snacking on a cracker. We're not in need, need, but we need your money if we want to keep doing this wonderful uh, ministry. The rosary, uh, Bible in a year at 5 a.m., all the things that we do. And we actually are very grateful to get the opportunity to do so. And like I said, this is something that we're all in together. We are the people yapping on the radio, but you guys are the ones who make it possible. So really looking forward to hearing from you guys at the Carathon next week. Well, bud, it's been another great show. Thanks for yeah, joining us. I, I know that Leonetti wants me to buy like this super awesome microphone that like attaches to my head and it, like I can I can rotate or levitate. Right. But um, I, I do feel like this week. I don't know. You guys will have to give me the update on your end. But on a technical level, did it sound like a monkey wasn't scratching at my mic? That's right. It did not sound like someone was trying to hurt me and stab me in the back. <laughs> So I think we might have to go with that. Well, bud, it's been great. Folks, it's the Uncommon Good. Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr, may Jesus Christ, the Prince of Peace, reign in our hearts, in our families, in our city, our state, our country, and the entire world. This has been the Uncommon Good. We will see you next week. God bless everyone. The Uncommon Good with Bo Bonner and Dr. Bud Marr is heard Wednesdays at 10 a.m. and 10 p.m. on Iowa Catholic Radio and on the official Iowa Catholic Radio app.